What's going on everybody? Peter Martin here. Welcome to the Jazz Piano Method. Welcome to this week's lesson. Really excited to be here. Thank you guys for being here. This is your safe space to delve into all things jazz piano. We don't, do, we don't delve into all things jazz piano every week, but we cycle through and every couple of months with the weekly lessons, we hit a lot of them. So excited that you're here. I am your guide for the next few minutes. Uh, you know how we do this. We have a little fun. We learn something hopefully have some ideas uh, for uh, your practice this week, um, whatever week it is, if we're in real time or if you're in the future. So hope everybody's well. All right, so this week's lesson is how to turn shapes into great improvisations. And I'm super excited about this because I think this is the first time, certainly in years, that I've just concentrated on this concept. So, uh, but I've talked about it a lot. A lot of you have asked questions about it. So I think it's going to be something that's going to be fun. And um, no matter kind of what you're working on now in your practice, you may be able to apply this. Almost any kind of tune, you can apply this to your improvisation. And, you know, it's how to turn shapes into great improvisation. It's one of the funner parts of what we do. When we talk about practicing scales and arpeggios, that's important. And I actually think it's fun, but it's a little bit more of like the lift and the weights. You know what I mean? It's not going out and playing the game, the football game or whatever. Um, not that anyone's doing that, I don't think. But uh, the idea is that we want to have ideas that lead to great improvisation so that we're having fun, so the audience is having fun, even if that's just your loved ones in the house, if that's a live stream, if you're at the Village Vanguard, doesn't matter. We're having fun when we're playing great stuff and having great ideas for improvisation. Okay, so I'm going to play a little bit and if I were a bell, it's kind of on my mind because we did a great listening sesh a couple weeks ago of Miles Davis. We'll link below in the lesson to uh, that recording Saturday night at the Blackhawk. Um, man, what a great recording. But the tune's kind of on my mind and I think it fits this well. Stop there. The head, we're not even going to really do, do much with the head uh, this week because we want to really get into these ideas for great improvisation. But just a little reminder, as we always talk about, the melody is your friend, uh, especially a great melody like this, a fun melody. This isn't the deepest tune, but it's got some cool things with the melody that relate to the harmonic movement, which, which has some great uh, positioning for you to really set yourself up for a good improvisation. So we'll just say that, as always, learn the melody really good in terms of the root movement and how it relates there so that as the harmony, you can have a place to go with your improvisation and a reference point in terms of the melody, even if you're not quoting the melody. You know? Right? That's just part of the melody, but that's guiding you through the harmony. So, so we're going to be looking at shapes, you know, you know, these kind of things that can also guide us through the harmony. But if we know that melody really good and the root movement, and remember, the root movement is really its own melody too. 
and you played in half notes, nice two feel, you'll start to hear that. And even if you're just playing the roots, that's its own melody, right? And then as you start to be able to do a bass line over it, if you hear it as a melody, you'll be able to connect, you'll kind of, your ears will start to force your hands to connect it in a way that's melodic. You'll make some mistakes, you'll play some stuff that doesn't sound good, but you'll be hearing it and that'll be the goal, okay? So that's enough on the melody, know the melody as always. Um, now, we're gonna go through a bunch of different ways that we can take shapes and turn them into great improvisations today, okay? So what do I mean by that? Any kind of single line that we play for an idea, you know, needs to fit somehow into what the form of the tune is at that particular time. So we're at the beginning of, you know, the tune's in F, where we're playing it in F. It starts on the two chord. So a G7, G13, sharp 11 kind of situation. And then to the five. So it's a two, five, one, but it's a little bit particular because it's not, it doesn't go there until the next bar. So. Okay, so we always have a, a, a decision to make in terms of what's the, what's the melodic story we want to tell over this harmonic situation that we're in at this part of the tune. Now at the beginning of the solo, we certainly have the opportunity to really you know, set things up in a clear way, but we're never restricted by what's here. It never has to be like, where we're just playing the, the correct scale, right? And even if we are just playing the correct scale, Once we start looking at shapes that are within that scale, it gets more interesting anyway, as opposed to just scale running. Now, the reality of how we put together stuff that sounds good, we're taking a combination of those things, right? We're doing some scale running, playing part of the scale, but not root, you know, one to one without doing anything. Broken fist, up to the ninth and coming down, that kind of a thing is what really works. And then we want to remember, we're not going to go deep into rhythmic concepts today because that's not what this lesson's about, but we know, what are we talking about all the time? Playing within the groove, learning the groove and how it relates to the form, always so important. So we're doing that first so that once we start to get into like applying these shapes to improvisation, we're not really having to think about the rhythm. We do want to check in on that, make sure we're in, in, in good rhythmic positioning because that, you can have the greatest shapes ever and the greatest melodies ever if you're not playing them in a rhythmically interesting way, it's not gonna really sound good, okay? But let's concentrate on one thing at a time, okay? So the first shape we're gonna talk about, and you know, really, I, like to, I would encourage you guys to think about the shapes as voicings. You know, we're pianists, we have such an advantage here because, you know, a lot of these things, if not all of them, can be played by a horn player or a singer, right? Because um, we're gonna be talking about a lot of single line situations, primarily. But we have an ability to play a voicing, say, and we're just going to start with jazz arpeggios. So G7. That's a voicing, right? All these different kinds of voicings. But we can hear all that together and then start to break it down melodically. All the different possibilities just over those four notes. And we're going G7. So look, this is just, here we go about that. We're going G dominant, right? And we're going primarily from the third to the ninth to start. That's what your chord is, okay? So, and then we go to the five chord, and then the one chord. So that's what the shape is. And you, you're probably thinking, ooh, that's, that sounds good, but not great. That's, that's right, we're gonna build up, we're gonna get there. But in order to have the shape in our hand and be able to play it like a voicing, and you know, next level with this is always going through all the keys. So that shape is in your hand, so that any time you encounter a time you wanna play it, you've already made the adjustments. Because remember, we're not guitar players where we can just shift our hand up and down here. 
Everything changes as we go through there. But we want to really know these shapes and have them in here so that when we go. That starts to sound better, but it's because I know the hand position of the shape to go to so that when I play melodically. I've got all those in my hands. Layering with some rhythm. Okay, we're gonna get to that one. That's a diminished one. That's a fun one. So the jazz arpeggio. On their own, they're they're good and they're important, and you can start at the the root. Those two shapes. Let's look at them on the overhead there. And I'm just going up chromatically, chromatically down because the the chromatic neighbors are always important. I think to be able to get. But even with that. We get the beginning of some nice, you know, interesting improvisation, maybe not quite great yet, but we're get on our way in terms of improvisation. Okay, now before we go into another one, I always like to take these things and say like, okay, how do we make them really interesting and great and the foundation? So with this one with the up to the ninth, I think the two passing tones in particular, you've always got a lot of choices of passing tones, but two in particular, the flatted ninth and the minor third. I think give it so much interest, right? So like in time it might be a one, two, three, four. So I added in a little bit of scale or kind of movement, but like we said, like these shapes really work great when you go into conjunction with other things. But that's nice there as opposed to. And then you do a little bit of offset rhythmically. Now you're starting to get some great sounding stuff, right? So that's the minor third, and then the, the other one was the flatted ninth. Because this is giving you, the, the actual functionality of this is giving you the minor third of the tonic that you're going to. So, because you know we're gonna end up at the F major, we're in the key of F major. Right? So this is giving you a little bit of blues connotation. And if you want to do it at the five, it could lead to there, but even on its own. Even on the one it works, not as well, but it still works. And you can do these together, minor third and minor ninth. So the shape is... It's the foundation of the shape, we'll look overhead again, is this. Remember we got this locked into our hands, every key. So those are just slight alterations. Should probably finger it like that. But having those in your hands, having the shape, right? Just like if you walked around and you're like, I have a claw. C7, G7, C, C7, C13, sharp 11. Like you can feel all those shapes, then you've got the ability to just digit by digit. Those are all shapes we're gonna get to today, okay? So there you go, so that's three, five, seven, nine. One other one with that I like to kind of throw in there is on the half diminished. Uh, one that I like to use, thank you Herbie Hancock, big shout out to Herbie Hancock out of Chicago, um, natural ninth as it dwells with the flat ninth. I love that sound. And you can extend it up. So like we're F major. A minor, let's make it A half diminished. Why not? Because we're going 2-5 to the G minor, right? That's fine playing like that scale, but let's do up to the ninth. It's almost like a passing tone on its own. Right? And you can go up to the 11th. That's the next shape. Sorry, I'm using my thumb on the black key. Right? Let me show you what this sounds like in, in the middle of some improvisation.
right? And then that's over a D alter. We'll get to that one. So that's how you can kind of use a, an unusual shape. And then we're going to look at some ways to resolve it. But I love that, that natural ninth and going up to the eleventh on the half diminished. Same shape pattern, three, five, seven, nine. Okay? All right, next, we have triad pairs. Now, this is a new kind of triad pairs, not the other kind of triad pairs, which I never totally understood anyway. So this is really just a variation of the three, five, seven, nine. It's a, sh it's a four note shape. And the reason I call it triad pairs because it's a pair of triads. So if we look at C7, C7, right? We got the dominant seventh, the flat nine, the sharp 11, F sharp, and A, the 13. We got two minor, minor thirds, right? So again, we want to really lock in that shape. Moving around chromatically, get that in all keys so that that's how it can be a, a cool shape. Give it a little bit of um, dissonance on that dominant chord, right? But when you think about them as triads, it gives you the ability to play around with the minor third, major third. So that's like a little F sharp minor with the major third. Remember, we're still over C7. Okay, triad pairs. Peter Martin, triad pairs. Jazz piano method, triad pairs. Um, two sets of thirds. So, and then you can break those down as one set of thirds, of course, as well. That's still a shape. It's a small shape, but we're at an interesting place as it relates to the chord that we're on. And these work a number of different situations, but I think on dominant chords, these triad pairs work especially good. And you want to think about building them up from the dominant seven. So on G7, minor third, and then we're spacing it out a perfect fourth, doing it the same as we did on the C7. Okay, but there's other ones you can do too. You can go there. Actually, I don't like that one that much. We're going to get to this one more from a diminished standpoint, but it's the same thing. You got a F minor triad, you know, a minor third, and a major third. Anytime you take two triads, think about that shape. You find one that you like. I mean, even that voicing is really triad pairs in a way. So you might say, well, I know that is an inversion of just a major nine. But once you start hearing them as triad pairs, you've got that. Because remember, these shapes that are going to really lead to some great improvisation, it's not just being able to feel them and automatically or in an automated way, just go to them. I'm on G7, so I'm gonna do Peter's triad pairs. No, like you wanna hear them and, and give you something, a place to play some interesting melodies in this area, as opposed to like, it's a G7, so I gotta, that's my area, everything in G Dorian, or even half, you know, diminish. Like, it's more like, Just gives you another place to create. You still got to create your, you're still going to want to create your own story, but it gives you another shape to start with. Okay? So that's triad pairs. Next, we have triads plus a minor third. So if we look at D flat major, no, 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 we're going to go. Oh, yeah, so this is the one we just did. I already kind of bled, bled into this, but that's the reason I have this coming out of the pairs. This is just adding major third and the minor third together and thinking about them. Um, is this the, oh no, this is a little bit different. Yeah, but it comes out of this concept. Okay, so G7, we're going to the tritone. There's several different places this can work um, and getting a little bit random with it gets even better, but we're going to look at it primarily from the uh, standpoint of a tritone. So G7, we're going to D flat, right? And we're thinking about that triad as a major third, but we're also thinking about the minor third, right? 
And depending on the situation you're in, this can be exciting. So we got G7 with the F. I'm playing just um, root and shell in the left hand, so you can really hear it. G, F, and B. Root, seventh, and third. And then the shape we're looking at. We're gonna, would be D flat triad. D flat major triad would normally be your situation for a tritone substitution, but we're gonna go minor. Because it's kind of a cool sound. Okay, so especially when you add the major third and the minor third, that can be a kind of fun thing. Triads with the minor third. Um, and you can do that over, you know, the actual, you know, but it's always better when you find somewhere else. And once you get these shapes, you can use them in so many places. So this is a D flat triad, and I'm, I'm just going in second inversion, right? Minor triad, major triad, D flat minor, D flat major. That sounds pretty good. Let's slow it down. All I'm using is that major triad and that minor triad. Okay? And then I'm gonna do the same thing over the five, F sharp. Major, minor. But the magic comes when you break it off for improvisation. So a lot of people are thinking, oh, I'm gonna play a tritone substitution. You think about the scale for the tritone substitution. So like a D flat dominant, and then like an F sharp, or even a Lydian dominant or something, which is okay, but this gives you a place to really give it some melodic flair. And once you learn these in one, you know, in one particular key, D flat, you're gonna to want to learn them in all. Hopefully, we're going next level. But once you learn them, you can start to try to apply them randomly in your playing to start to see what resonates with you. So this is built on a tritone, but what about... What about if I just try some different ones? A. That gives you that kind of Lydian sound. E flat over C. It's just a major triad with the minor third as well. Okay? I could, I could sit on each one of these for so long, but I've got more, so I gotta move along. Um, you guys can let me know in the comments, as always, um, if there's particular ones you want me to ever do deeper dives on. If, you're, if something's resonating in particular, please leave me a comment. And as always, over on the left-hand side, you can make a request for a lesson. Always doing those, having fun there. Okay, two-handed voicings. This is our next shape that we're gonna think about, our kind of shape concept. Um, for improvisation. And what this is really based upon is all the great stuff that we can do as pianists, right? With two hands. So even if you're not ready for kind of a, a, a real sort of linear, two-handed, seamless, you know. Well, let me see if I can play over the tune we're working on. that kind of playing, Bill Evans and beyond, Chick Corea, all that great stuff, um, we can still take the foundation for what is going to eventually get us there that we probably already have, which is two-headed voicings, even as simple as so what, right? So that's two-handed, but even if we go one-handed, so if we look at, um, say like an F major, we've got We've got A, D. This is kind of a variation on the usage of a so what chord, right? But over F major. So we're going to take this all for the right hand for now and use this to start to widen our approach and our thought process. So 
we can't necessarily reach that unless you've got the most mammoth hands ever, but we can think about it. And how are we able to do that? When we play this shape, we listen to the individual notes. We might even do some practice where we sing the inner voices. Go through all the different shapes so that we get them in our hands. But then that becomes a place that we can look for a wider, more expansive view of the piano landscape for our improvisation, okay? So, how do we get into this? Take the voicings that you know, the really good sounding voicings, and it doesn't matter if it's one that everybody does, or this one, our traditional 13 G7, thank you McCoy Tyner, Winton Kelly, many others, 7th, 3rd, 7th, 3rd, 13, 9th, 5th, and root on bottom and top and really this is just you know the foundation of this is really it's all force not all perfect force but all force building up diatonically from the seven but even that one we can look at this for our improvisation combined with a little bit of major try with the major third and the minor third we're starting to sound good we're sounding good this stuff is not that hard shapes Okay, so those are two-handed voicings. Um, and another one on the G7 that I made note of, I thought might, might be interesting, is this one, because it combines the triad. So we're going um, F, so G, F, the dominant seventh, third, B, and the left hand, then right hand, we got four notes, E, A, C sharp, E. also start to layer these right so this is just taking the, that shell in the left hand and we're placing it in here and you might say oh that's just G 13 sharp 11 Lydian dominant but which one sounds better or well they both sound good we can use them both right Okay, so you can always take those, I mean you can't always, but often you can take these voicings and layer them together, two-handed voicings. Um, cool, now we're going to get into some diminished situations um, for shapes, and these are really fun. You can use them over diminished chords, of course, you can also use them over major chords uh, as kind of a, a little bit of a, a, a dramatic harmonic flair that you would pull out of your melodic improvisation and then resolve as major, depending on the situation. Uh, and you can also use them, and this is where I primarily use them, actually over dominant chords. Um, so let's talk about that. Um, let's look at the F, um, oh, so many great diminished shapes, right? We're just going to hit a few, but F diminished 7. And this is one that for some of you, depending on your stretch, like I'm barely there, you can break it into two hands. We've got the F, the root of the diminished, the minor third, flatted fifth, that's your, that's your diminished triad. And then you got your major seventh, which is important because you either have a diminished seventh or a major seventh. Those are your two choices strictly within the diminished situation. And then remember earlier, we went up to that ninth. We love that because it's, it's like a leading tone up beneath that minor third. You've also got this nested minor triad, E minor triad, which is great. A lot of good stuff happening in there. So with that, um, especially if you're not, can't, I mean, it's bad finger to try to stretch that out anyway. We want to think about these kind of things as broken, right? So breaking them up, we take the shape, we know the shape, and we can move through the different registers. just learn each one of the shapes, hopefully not playing it sloppy like I was doing. Do as I say, not as I play. <laughs> but the key to executing this and making it sound good is really knowing those shapes, right? You see, I'm just like feeling, I'm just, I, I love the way this stuff feels because I know what it sounds like, so I'm moving through all the different, you know, inversions and places on the piano, but it's all based on this diminished... 
And as you practice it, it's going to seem a little restrictive because it's like, how do I make something good over that? You know, the reality is just going to be... You're going to be able to add other stuff in there. Okay, so usage of this one. Remember we said it can go over, obviously, the... When you're in a diminished, but that's kind of like, you know, I don't know, like... playing over that actual diminished chord, but how much do we actually sit on diminished chords? Not a lot. But, back to the... So we go... And then we're at the one. So we're on the F major, you can play around with that, that diminished, F diminished, and then resolve to the major. Sounds good. Okay? Um, then, let's look at, this stuff was so clear when I wrote it out to myself. Oh yeah, okay, that's major, that's diminished, that we can use this diminished shape over. Let's talk about dominant, that's the third area, the one I said that we use a lot. So same one. Now we're gonna use it on the G, the G uh, 13, okay? So we're building up from the dominant seventh. also build up from the minor second. So this is on the dominant seven for the G7. Right? Uh, and then we go to the C7. We could do it off the B flat, but let's do it off the minor second. And when you combine these, fun stuff. Right? Well, let me do it in the time of the, the tune. Yeah. I'm going to add it on the F as well, so we'll have all three. Uh, one, two, three. What did we say? F, yeah. Okay? All based on that same diminished shape. All right. Good stuff, good stuff. Um, yeah, and then just remember on that one, the foundation is the diminished triad in the major seventh. The ninth is great too, but this is really what that foundation is. All right, just a couple of more. Um, I mean, there's so many more, but just a couple more for today, for this week. Um, augmented triad plus a major seventh. So we've got, um, I love this shape. I love this sound. I love. Oh, there's a great Billy Strayhorn tune. Oh, no. Oh, I guess that's a little different. That second phrase, right. I think it's, um, ah, somebody, will, somebody will know the name of that tune. I'll do that song in a couple weeks. I love that song. I'm, I've been wanting to get back into Billy Strayhorn. But so that's what the melodic shape of it is, the, the, the melodic flow of it. The shape is just an augmented triad, right? And you see how I'm fingering it kind of funky, one, two, three. That's because I'm already ready for, for fun things to happen above it. So that's part of like learning these shapes. You gotta learn them with the funky fingerings sometimes. And what's great about this is it's an augmented triad and melodically we've got a major triad there too. So the, yeah, that's up to the major seventh, but we've also got a, a, a C sharp major triad. So when we play around with minor third, major third, that's in the... Okay, now places we can use this, uh, obviously over in A, Major seven, sharp five, but how many of those do we see? Well, we might see a few. But um, some ideas I had here, F7. So we've got that sharp nine thing. And you might say, well, that's just a sharp nine. Yes, but if we think about this as, say like an F7 sharp nine, with like a flat of 13th maybe, it's really a different shape and a different function. So it's a good one, nothing wrong with that. But that's a different, especially when you play it melodically. Okay? Um, also, we can go to the tritone of the F7, B7. This is a great usage, and it's a little bit more inside. This really gives you that 13 sharp 11 kind of thing. the 
the difference? B7. two different places to resolve. Okay, so that's the augmented triad plus major seven. Um, and then the last one I wanted to talk about is fourth. So this is one, you know, and I've covered this a lot in the lessons on pentatonics and stuff and pentatonic boot camp for sure, but because they kind of lend itself to that kind of thing. But with, really with this, what we're talking about, you know, and, and I alluded to this a little bit earlier on that G, that traditional force dominant where we start on the seventh. Right? Um, that's all fours. But we want to look at it like, you know. So show you above again. We're just going one hand with perfect force. And there's two different ways to think about this. Diatonic or chromatic? That's chromatic. This is diatonic. And this is definitely an area where common, combining these can really sound good. So if I'm um, still on, if I were a bell. So I started out diatonic. These are fourths, so they're not staying perfect because it's wherever. And then I got to the C7, and these are still um, fourths, but like I've got a tritone here because I'm thinking uh, half hold diminished, and then I can go chromatic over that. And then over major, maybe I go back to diatonic, okay? So they're, they're both good, and you want to learn both the shapes, and they're a little different because if you're going um, chromatic, the intervals are staying the same, you know, and it's great to get these in both hands. So you might go. Don't be sloppy like me. and then we could go diatonic, say, over, you know, the dominant. Here we can get to some very uh, Stravinsky. That's diatonic, but I digress. <laughs> so that's force, and you know... different fun places to put it in so um all right well there you go enjoy the transcription enjoy the lesson i hope everyone is well this is how to turn shapes into great improvisation i hope that you have fun with it i hope you have some good places to apply it in the tunes that you're working on maybe if i were a bell maybe something else so until next week happy practicing all right all right youtube i'm still here that's how we do it whoo i made it I, was, I told you guys I was nervous. I know I was going a little bit fast. Uh, we used to have a sign in here that said slow down because I was notorious for speeding through the lessons. When you're part of the jazz piano method, though, you can just pause it. You, we even have a thing where you can slow everything down, watching in slow motion and stuff. So that was kind of always my fallback, I felt like, when I was going too fast. But let me just look and see if you guys are still here. That would be super awkward if something happened and you weren't here. Okay, it looks like you are still here. Uh, what would you guys think? Um, those of you awesome, sick, much fun. Okay, good, good. 
Um, come on and play that. What's up, Beaver's in? Tuning in late. That's all right. We're going to be available still here. Um, Ishfahan. That's it. Gene Kelly. Thank you. Ishfahan. Baby, dibby doo. Booby doo. Scooby doo. Um, cool. Am I late for the class? You're never late. I mean, you might be a little late, but you know, it's all good. It's right here. Um, okay. Do you guys have any questions about, um, well, first, let me just tell you. Jazz Piano Method, so we did a little birthday celebration. My birthday was yesterday, um, and uh, it officially expired yesterday, I believe, the discount, but we're extending it to today just to you guys. So if you see, a, there'll be a link below in the description, and I believe it's everything is the same. Um, just like $50 for all the courses. I turned 50, so everything's like based on 50, you know, but some of the discounts are even bigger, but all the courses are $50. But if you're not a member of Jazz Piano Method or Piano Access Pass, or you liked what you saw and want to see more of this, what I would recommend you get, if you're sure you want to join up, is the best deal we have is the Piano Access Pass for a year uh, at 50% off. And we very rarely do that. It's usually like kind of Black Friday and New Year type of situation. So you might want to jump on that. Link below, maybe a link in the chat as well. And that's available for the rest of the day for you guys. Um, or if you want to just dabble in one of the courses. But the Piano Access Pass is great because you get the, what we just did now is, is a weekly lesson. I do one of these every week, like I say. They, they come out on Fridays, um, and that gives you access to that, but it also gives you access to every single piano course we have. So Adam's daily guided practice session, Jeff Keezer's wonderful recorded courses, plus Jeff Keezer does guided practice sessions live right here, not right here, on Open Studio. You've got to be a member for that. Um, we have Elio Alves. Um, we've got a bunch of new stuff, and it gives you access to all of our piano courses. Um, so... But it gives you jazz piano method, is, is what I'm trying to tell you. So that would be your best route. You can do it monthly or yearly. Yearly is a very good discount. Um, so I'm going to stick around for a minute. But OK, I'm not going anywhere, but I'm going to go over here because I have to stop. We actually record the audio at next level audio, and it gets mixed in. So we've been doing that on a separate system. So you should still be able to hear me. But I'm going to save that. We're going to press stop in Logic. And then I'm also going to keep the camera going, but we're recording in 4K as well in two different locations here, uh, as well as streaming. So if we pulled this off today, I'll be super happy because. And then I'm just going to come over here and check the chat here to make sure. Lots of comments in the chat if you want to start with that. Okay, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. I'm happy to stick around for you guys. What's up, Italy? Herman, man, I love Italy. I'm so, this is probably the first July and August in, I couldn't tell you how many years that I'm not in Italy playing music. And, uh, I, you know, normally I would be depressed about that, but I have so many wonderful memories from that, from these years. I mean, I'm talking going back to like, the first time I went to Italy in 1991 with Betty Carter and played some beautiful outdoor venues. We played in like some town square. I mean, just went down to Terramino, Sicily and played. I didn't know, I was 20 years old. I didn't know what the hell I was doing, but I knew it was beautiful and I knew I loved it. And I started to learn about the food and then the wine later on and stuff. But this is probably the first summer that I, I was not in Italy at all in July or August. So I miss it, but the happy memories of it and knowing that I'll be able to go back hopefully next year, if not the year after, some point, you know, kind of carries me forward for sure. Um, okay, Kim is asking, can you talk about the HW using force more? What is HW? I should know. Somebody tell me what that means. Okay, I, blah, 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 blah. HW? I don't, I don't know. I'm sorry. That's super, probably easy what you're saying. Da, love Stravinsky. Exactly. Ciao. What's up, Donald? Um, boom, boom, boom. Thanks, Antonio. Thank you, thank you. All the best for the next 50 years, exactly. Parli Italiano, no, nine. Nah, see, that's not even the right. I mean, you know, a couple words. Grazie, grazie mille, prego. Um, all Access Pass, absolutely. That's that. All Access Pass gives you everything, including Jazz Piano Method. Shakoya, thanks for the happy birthday. Thank you guys, everybody. I got so many messages yesterday. I was so overwhelmed uh, with the love and everything, and I, I got to spend a great day primarily with my family, which was amazing. And um, thank you all for reach, for everybody that reached out. I'm sorry I haven't gotten back personally with everybody, but I can tell you this. 
I got an amazing text message from Christian McBride. I didn't even get back to him until this morning. He was just like, I love you, bro. Hope you have a great day. Like, that's how clogged up I got. And I was a little bit off the grid as well. Um, but, uh, boo, 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 boo. Uh, Anne says, I think I can learn this never in this temple. Wow. But thank you, Peter. Okay. I know. I go fast sometimes. But what I want to show you guys, and we do this a lot in the jazz piano method, and folks, I think, start to get this. Like, this is not just about my, me being flashy and being like, you're never going to get to this. You can get to this. You know, now, I've been doing this for a while. You know what I mean? And now, look, I'm 50 years old. I can really say I've been doing this a while. But a lot of this stuff is more achievable than you think. And I think, well, I know because I've had people go through the jazz piano method and been with me for several years that are like, you know, this unlocked things for them to learn to do stuff. This is not like, oh, I'm giving you some secret. I'm giving you some, some techniques and ways to practice and some frameworks for thinking about this stuff. It, it takes a lot of practice to get it. You can do like a moderate amount of practice and get some of it and be able to play it in more simple situations, which is fine. It all depends on how much time we have, um, you know, and how much you want to put into it. But all this stuff, it's not like an all or nothing. You can start to accumulate this stuff. Once you start to get these, these shapes, I don't know. It's like I wake up in the middle of the night and can feel them. I, I walk around and I feel the piano in my hands because I've played them so many times. But I'm also thinking about what they sound like as I'm playing them, whether I'm at the piano or not. And so the ear training component, I can't overstate that enough. I probably didn't state it enough, but okay. Um, Blue Road says, those were some incredible diminished shape examples. Maybe you can expand on that. Happy birthday, Peter. Thank you. Yeah, that's, um, that was definitely, I know I spent a lot of time in the lesson, but that could probably be its own thing. And, um, you know, we're always going on deep dives on, on um, jazz piano method. That's the great thing about it. There's always another one coming next week. So I'm happy to go on deep dives, and I really take my cue from what the members are asking about. Um, all right, what other questions? I'm sorry, I got so many comments. Thank you, guys. Um, that I'm having a little bit of, you might want to drop your question again, if you don't mind, at the bottom in case I miss something up higher. Maury says, I need to see a scan of Peter's brain. He has an abundance of ideas, never ending. Yeah, maybe at times, and then there's other times when the scan might be so <laughs> blank that it would be embarrassing, but who knows. Um, so, yeah, if you don't mind, uh, Nicole says, just want to say, I think this might be the best Open Studio info I've seen. I've learned a lot from Open Studio, but this was full of heaps of great stuff. Might be the best one yet. Thank you, Nicole. That's, that's very flattering of you to say, especially I've been tuning into Adam's uh, YouTube lives and his uh, GPSs uh, with his ardent followers, and I think that's some of the best content. So if I'm up there with that, I'm, I'm happy. Um, boop, boop, boop. Tips for improvising. Yeah, I mean... You know, th of course, these shapes, I think, are, are great sort of foundational tips for improvisation. But rhythm is always so important, you know. So <laughs> learning how to play with precision is something that can be practiced. And we talk about that all the time. I mean, that's like been a recurring theme of mine since we started this. Um, and a lot of techniques for that. Um, but also, like, how you're going to phrase and how you're going to put weight on certain notes is much more of a, it's, it's, it's tricky because you have to let it come and there's not, like, it, you have to sort of have to let it happen. It's not to say that you can't try things and, and, and break down certain phrases. We do that as well and, and say, like, you know, bat, 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 bang, like, think about how you accent and put stress on certain notes and, and how that changes the overall phrase. Because, you know, sometimes if we think about, like if I were to play, like I've prepared it with a couple of measures of walking bass line. So you feel where the time is. You feel where the groove is. You, you, the listener is even starting to feel where the form li lays. But if I just play, single line, like I'm a saxophone player or something, I don't have a left hand, then how you phrase it, where the rhythm lies, and I'm talking about beyond just being able to groove and play swing and play at a steady 
temple, which there's specific things you can practice for that, but being able to feel that when you don't have the left hand um, is something that we can practice, but it doesn't necessarily, I can't give you, I can give you techniques to practice to start to train your ear so that it'll start to come out. That's what I can do. So what happens is once you can do, see a lot of people, they skip that step. Like they don't realize how important, like they want to rely on the left hand, which is fine. They don't realize how important it is to be able to play this song. Like it has to sound just as good. When nothing else is happening. And it goes at whatever level you're doing. Like if you're doing, you know, fancy or triplets or like sloppy stuff like that. You know, whatever you play has to have that kind of rhythmic precision and phrasing that really lays right within the groove and right within the form. So we can build that up though if we don't allow ourselves to play anything that is more complicated then we can do that and, and we add a little bit every day. Now maybe you'll have some breakthrough days, maybe you'll have some eight hour practice days and you can add more than others, but what we don't want to do is be like well I can only sound good if I'm you know. <laughs> only sound good if you're pulling out all the different piano tricks and you've got all that. The real test is can you be like and still outline the harmony, play within the groove, swing, simple rhythms, you know, then you can add the other things. So to me that's actually the more impressive stuff. I do the other stuff because I know you guys like it and you want to do it and you will do it and it's fun and it's great to build up but it's like this is where you can really see if somebody can play and it's the most achievable you know it's not easy but it is simple so it's not easy because it takes a lot of practice it takes a lot of dedication it takes a lot of like wow I don't feel like I got better at all this week but I know that I am when I look back you know that kind of grit um, but it's definitely achievable by everyone. All right. Um, wow, I'm overwhelmed with the comments. Thank you. Um, and what can I play with the left hand, um, like standards? Yeah, I mean, it's. I, I have to get into that in another lesson. That's just. It's. Uh, it's a whole other thing. But again, we're starting simple. You know, root and shell, plus one root and shell, pretty, all that kind of good stuff. Shells, tenths. Yeah, Laze. Laze knows. Uh, shells, tenths, rootless voicing. And don't, don't ever forget about the chromatic. And these, you know, shapes in the left hand and the right hand, we, we, we talked about shapes today. That's what this all was about for melodic stuff in the right hand. But you can take the same shapes of things in your left hand. You should be able to do them equally well in the right hand and use them for voicing. They're not always going to work, but that's an option. Whether you're mirroring the hands or not, it's an option there. Yeah. Um, what are the figurings for the pentatonic scale after B minor? I paid them and never received them. They should be if you're on the on the pentatonics. We have figurings for all those exercises in the pentatonic uh, boot camp or whatever the heck we under. What is it? Pentatonic jazz piano technique pentatonics. In that course, we have, we did the most extensive fingering ever. We were hours in here, me and Adam and uh, somebody else like arguing and writing them down and going back and forth, but they're all in there. If you didn't get them, please just drop an email to support at openstudiojazz.com and get that. But it should be on, you should be able to download the PDF in your course dashboard. Um, hello from Denmark. I love Denmark. What's up, Nikolai? Nik Nikolai? I hope that's right. I love Denmark. Um, spent a lot of time there actually playing, but also had a beautiful family vacation in between two tours a couple years ago. Copenhagen, right there by the, the little lake. Oh, unbelievable. We had such a good week. So expensive. So I don't know how you guys do it. 
So expensive, but so great. Um, restricted practice, AK, exactly. Restricted practice, for those of you that don't know, is just the kind of thing we're talking about here, like where you would take this concept of shapes uh, for improvisation and you would practice with something very simple in the left hand so you don't have to think about it. And if you can't do that, just no left hand is fine, but you would say play over the entire tune that you're working on um, very simply just exploring one idea at a time. It gives your ears an, a chance to really focus on it. It gives you a chance to perfect these small details that are so important, time, phrasing, and stuff. But while you're working on just one concept, which is being able to inject your you know, melodic um, improv with these shapes as a jumping off point. Sorry, I'm sweating. I'm excited. Look at this. That's disgusting. Oh, well. What can you do? Um, where will the transcriptions be? I have the all access pass. So for Jazz Piano Method, the, tr the lessons that are transcribed, which are just about every one that's worth it at this point, um, uh, especially the new ones, uh, it'll be right in the lesson. It's right there with the living notation. You'll see it right there. Um, sometimes, depending on, like, this lesson will actually probably be Friday's lesson, so he, and I played a lot, so the, the transcription may not be up until next week, because everything's manually done. Like, we don't do any automated transcription, because it just doesn't, it's, it's not accurate, and it's, it's crap. So we put a lot of time and effort uh, into transcribing each note, and that's why it takes a minute. Half hole, you mentioned it in reference to playing fourth patterns. Yes, Kip, thank you for saying that again. HW, I should have known that. So, half hole uh, diminished. So that would be like that kind of a where you're going through. Can we see here? Boom. So we got force. And you're going to go, if you go diatonically, you're going to get some thirds, which is fine because of how that scale is constructed. If you go like on a major scale or any of the modes of the major, you're never going to get thirds, I don't believe. Yeah, because you're going to stay in fourths. But I believe it's because half whole is a octatonic scale. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You're going to get some thirds, which is fine, and it's some interesting stuff. You can, you can do it also with the... Um, uh, there was another scale, I can't remember what. But, oh, well, you can go with over the, so like if you're on a diminished or flat 9, sharp 11, a situation where you use like 13, sharp 11, flat 9, C. And you want to use a half hole as kind of a foundation. Half hole scale, so you could go. You can combine diatonic with chromatic, so. Now we're going chromatic. I'm sorry, I'm not kind of hearing how to make that sound good right now. <laughs> sorry, that's the way it goes sometimes. That kind of sounds just um, a little bit like an etude. But it's something to play around with. And when you're doing any of these things, if you don't like them, don't do them just because I said do them. Or just don't do them just because I sounded good when I did them. Sometimes these things become part of our often. They become part of our personal style, as they should. So it's not about like us all doing it the same. And when you practice something and learn a shape, and it doesn't work in a situation, but you hear it, that's good too. You know what I mean? It's, not, it's never like, oh, I failed. No, we want to learn what to hear, what to play, and what not to play. There'll be another situation where that works. But we just, you know, it's just like in life. I mean, you got to fail at some stuff in order to grow. It's not all about knocking it out the park all the time. Uh, Gershwin Prelude number one. That's hard. Uh, there should be a Nobel Prize for jazz piano structure. Okay, you're making me blush now. Um, Bruno said, look, I'm such a short-term memory guy. I'm looking like the comments at the bottom are giving some advantage. My apologies. I'm 16 years old, Bruno says. Do you have advice to improve at the piano and improve at jazz? Yes. Okay, the first thing is take a deep breath. I think there's some older folks on here like, like, like myself that can reinforce this. You've got a lot of time. I remember 16, and um, I've, all my kids are older than 16, and some of them very recently, so I know it feels like the world is moving fast, and you don't have a lot of time. You've got a lifetime. I mean, I've been playing the piano since I was three years old, maybe even before. I think I was three. Violin, and piano, two, three. Um, and so I've been playing a long time, but I still feel like 
I've got, I know that I've got a lot to learn, which is what's exciting about it. So we're looking at a lifetime of, of learning and growth. So that doesn't mean that you just sit around and say, oh, I, I can play video games all day. I'll learn to play good when I'm in my 20s. No, you're trying to improve all the time, but you want to use a perspective of not, okay, I'm 16. I want to go to music school when I'm 18, so I have two years to learn everything. No, you have two years to get ready for your audition for music school, but that's just a thing like you take the SAT, you graduate high school, whatever. These are just short term. They're not even really goals. You know, nobody has a goal of graduating high school. It's, it's what graduating high school can take you to the next level, can take you to the next level. So, you know, think about your musical progress long term, but think about specific things that you want to improve short and medium term. So, and focus on that because that'll get you more process oriented. So let's say you, do, you know, I, I've had a lot of young people that are like, come to me, even like when I was teaching at the university level and like, man, show me how to play that voicing. Show me how to do this. How do you play over Maiden Voyage? How do you play blah, blah, blah? And I was like, okay, that's the first lesson. I was like, before we get to that, how are you on your scales? Your scale finger. Oh, I know all those. Oh, good. Well, this will be easy. I don't have to teach you a lot then. Awesome. You're prepared. Okay, give me um, an altered scale. Start at C. We're going to go contrary motion, two octaves, just nice and slow, kind of warm up. Now, that was not an example where I messed up of what they did. I just messed up. But I know these scales, you know, I should know it better. But when I would ask them that, they're like, oh, no, no I haven't done that one in a while, but I know it. And I was like, no, if you know it, it doesn't matter if you haven't practiced it in whenever. You know it. It's like riding a bicycle, right? So I know those fingerings. I could definitely use a little practice on this refresher, but I haven't done it in a long time. So at least I can kind of pull it out because I knew it. I learned it. I have it inside of me. They, you know, a lot of times you guys are skipping over these essential elements and you want to get to all the really cool stuff. You can do that as you're going to, but you're 16 years old. Get the foundations. Make sure by the time you're 20, by the time you're 18, that you know every single scale in all keys, arpeggios, like the back of your hand. Because that's just, like, that's the, um, the basic skills that you need to play this instrument, especially to be able to improvise, play, be a jazz player. So stick to those things that are very, like, don't worry about, like, how do I become the most creative improviser today? That takes, like, life experience and listening. And, but you can say, how can I learn two additional keys of the altered scale so that I'm going to be able to get to all 12 within six days or six weeks or whatever? Like, we can be very finite about certain things. But a lot of times we waste time, like, getting more esoteric. Make sure you take care of the basics. That, and, and really, this, this kind of practice should be, like, 80% of your practice. 20% let your, let your mind go in the clouds and all that kind of stuff. Okay? And you got some time, so all the best and best of luck. Uh, I played since I was seven. Yeah, that's cool, Bruno. Yeah, I mean, I think I've, I've heard great players on many instruments that started when they were three and some that started when they were 17. So it's, it's great to start young because I think it's such a fun thing to do when you're a kid, but it's definitely not like it's ever too late. I don't believe that. Reginald Veal, one of the best bass players on this planet, and you know, quite possibly, definitely one of the three best bass players I've ever played with. Um, started playing bass, I believe, when he was 16 years old. I, and electric, and then didn't, maybe didn't play acoustic for another year. I mean, incredible. Like, he sounds like, he, I mean, he's, his intonation, everything, so. Uh, would love to see a lesson with you playing with a bass player or small group and how you comp. Steve says that. Yes, um, so we have some of that. Uh, the rhythm section fundamentals. Um, and we have rhythm section workout where I'm playing with Ruben Rogers. And then on Christian McBride's course, I actually play a fair amount. I did not force my way in as founder of Open Studio. He invited me. I was producing the course. I said, no, 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 this is, and he's like, no, I want you to play. Um, so you can check those out. That's a great thing with the piano access pass. You, you don't just get jazz piano method. You get, well, actually, Christian's course, I think you need all access pass. But you get all the piano stuff, the rhythm section fundamentals. We, we go deep on how to play with bass players, how to play with drummers, all that kind of stuff. Um, all right, I'm going to take a couple more and then I'm going to jump off here because I just realized I'm feeling weak because I haven't had lunch today and this is going longer than I was hoping, but I love being here. And I can't tell you guys how much I appreciate you guys uh, being here and hanging out and ooh, there's a lot of folks on here. And just to say, again, uh, the birthday sale 
is still going on for the rest of the day. Link below, probably link in the chat as well. You can access that. It's going to be done at midnight tonight. Um, and so if you're thinking about Jazz Piano Method, if you're new here, welcome, first of all. And if you're like, what the hell? Why did YouTube tell me to watch this? I don't know, but welcome. Glad that you're here. Hope that you enjoyed it. Um, and just so you know, if you're not sure about this and you're feeling pressure because of this big sale because of the birthday, feel free to join. And um, we have a what is it, 30 day money? It doesn't matter what, we have an unlimited money back guarantee is the reality of it. Um, I think it's 30 days officially. But what, what is very important to me and, and as co-founder of this company is like, I never want people coming and buying a course or joining Jazz Piano Method and, it's not, and they're not getting anything out of it. So there's a refund always available or if you wanna come on for a couple weeks and then you're like, well I thought I was liking it but I'm really not getting use out of it and I don't have a lot of money now, we're, we are like, instant refund with no questions asked we don't make you call us you can call us if you want but just do it online you just just drop us an email if you want or you can go on and just cancel no pressure like we're really in this for the long haul i have people on the jazz piano method from the very beginning i still remember their names and so this is very much something that especially the jazz piano method because it's a new lesson and it's a dynamic thing and it's it's an organic thing and so we want people on that it's the right level that you like my teaching style you don't mind going fast a little bit and having to pause um and so yeah so feel free to come on and check things out it's no risk is what i'm trying to say um what's up pick and stone west pacific northwest in the house um one day peter and adam are going to cook keto and plant-based but jazz style uh, we recorded some podcast episodes yesterday, and we, we, we always get into a little bit of keto versus plant-based. But I'll give you guys, since Adam is on vacation, I wish I was on vacation. Must be nice. Um, Adam is not officially keto anymore. I'm just putting it out there so you guys can ra razz him about that if you want. I don't even really know what keto is. Um, do we got any plant-based uh, jazz musicians in the house here? Any vegans? Drop, drop, drop a comment. I would love to see that. I, I'm, I'm noticing that the Venn diagram between um, plant-based diet and jazz musician is like non-existent. And I'm, I'm very, I hope this is a safe space. I don't even talk about it a lot because folks like Christian McBride and um, they're, they're, you know, it's, uh, it's a little bit against the jazz ethos, especially the better player you are. It's like, there's a lot of like, man, that sounded so good. It was like a big rack of ribs. And I mean, I get it. I've eaten a lot of ribs in my life. So I know I'm in a little bit uncharted waters um, Bruno, thank you very much. You helped very much. Great. That's what I'm here for. Luke's wife is vegan. I was for three. Okay, you know what's up. You know what's up. Okay, good. So I'm going to go eat. Thank you guys so much. Jazz Piano Method. First one live. I made it. I did it. Uh, we'll do this again if you guys enjoyed sometime. Until next time. Oh, join me tonight. What I almost forgot. Tonight, uh, listening sesh. We're going Brazilian. I'm gonna to try to make a caipirinha. I'm gonna see if I can get Homero Luvamo, who's gonna join on the live. We got two of the best Brazilian musicians in the world that are gonna do a breakdown of Elise uh, Regina and Tom Joe being the classic record. So please join us. It's gonna be fun. Adam may show up, it depends on his Wi Fi, but I got two guys that really know their stuff. So thanks, everybody. We're gonna see you next time. Peace.